Cutting Oils Explained. In this video, we are going to be covering types of cutting fluids, characteristics of cutting fluids, built-up edge, homemade cutting fluids, inactive cutting fluids, active cutting fluids, and wettability. In this video, we are also covering about 80% of what an apprentice needs to know in the area of cutting fluids to pass the C of Q. Before we get started, please take a moment to like and subscribe. It's free, and it'll help me out. Okay, let's get started right now. Warning, viewer discretion is advised. This video is made for apprentices and may contain scenes that are over-explained and may not be appropriate for your skill level. There are three main types of cutting oils. Straight cutting oil, soluble cutting oil, and synthetic fluids. Straight or mineral oils are based on refined petroleum products. They contain no water and are formulated for medium to heavy duty applications in which lubrication is more important than cooling. These cutting oils are most often used on older machines at slower speeds. Soluble oils usually contain additives to enhance lubrication, inhibit rust and corrosion, and a biocide to prevent objectionable odor, basically rancidity. Commonly called soluble oils, they actually don't dissolve in water, but the concentrates contain an emulsifier that form a milky emulsion when mixed. Synthetic oils are made from detergent-like compounds, synthesized hydrocarbons, organic esters, polyglucide, glucols, phosphate esters, and other synthetic bases. In use since the 1950s, synthetics are typically the cleanest and clearest, providing a transparent formulation that is often dyed green and other colors. They are formulated to lubricate, cool, reduce oxidization, eliminate smoke, reduce misting, and provide rust protection. Characteristics of cutting fluid. Cooling. High heat absorbing capacity. What does that really mean? And how is that achieved? It is achieved through wettability. What is wettability? Well, if we take a look at the left side, that's a water molecule or a droplet that's round. If we take a look at the right side, that's one that flattens out. In this example, let's pretend that the arrows is the amount of heat transfer from one area to the actual water droplet. So the one with the small amount of area, or the one arrow, will only transfer a certain amount of heat. When we take a look at the one on the right, how it has more arrows, it's also flattened and widened out. So therefore, there's more area in contact with the actual surface. Therefore, more heat transfer can go through. So it's like if you look at your car and you see water beating up, that's what you want for your car because it maintains a better finish, but that's not what you want for cooling. If we take a look at this example, the one on the left will have better heat absorbing capability than the one on the right. Lubricating. Lubricating is important for a bunch of different reasons. It helps prevent built up edge. Built up edge is also called BUE. In this illustration, let's take a look at the little blue dot that's circled. Uh, that's the actual built-up edge. Uh, if we take a look at the red, that's the part. The black is the cutting tool, and the yellow is the chip coming off. What happens is, as the chip comes off, it heats up and melts some of the metal, which is the blue dot, and it actually welds itself onto the cutting tool. The problem with that is, is it welds itself on, then it gets released, then another piece welds itself on, then it gets released. And what that causes is something called cratering. Let's follow the yellow arrow. What happens is, on this piece, the gray is the cutting tool, the red is the actual work piece. So the part comes off, and it welds itself on, and it removes a little bit of material. So that little groove in there is supposed to represent the cratering. Well, what happens during this process is it keeps going and going and going, and the crater gets larger and larger and larger, until you have catastrophic failure of the tool. If we take a look on the left-hand side, what we have is an end mill and we have catastrophic failure on an end mill where the built up edge didn't release and it just basically welded itself all the way around. Let's take a look at chip formation. We're going to zoom in to the area where the cutting tool makes contact with the part. So if we take a look in the black, the black line there, that's the shear plane. The blue is the area of plastic deformation, the yellow is the chip, and the red is the part. By changing the shape of the blue area, will determine what your chip will actually form as. 
This may sound obvious, but it is extremely important to put coolant where the tool makes contact with the workpiece and the chip. Heat generated with no coolant. This is considered the most optimal uh, machining situation that you could possibly have. Is 80% of the heat goes into the chip, 10% of the heat goes into the part, and 10% of the heat goes into the cutting tool. That is ideal, but it is very difficult to achieve. Controlling the heat generated. In most cases, flooding will remove 50% of the heat generated during most machining operations. In most cases, this is enough to make the part maintain a neutral temperature. There are other options for excessive heat generating operations as well. Jet and mist applications. Basically what this is, is compressed air pushed through with coolant at the same time. That formula can cool down a specific area 25 times faster than coolant alone. But there are significant health ramifications for this. It is recommended if you're using an atomizer that you wear a respirator, refrigerated system. Basically what it is is the coolant goes through a refrigeration process and comes out of the machine a neutral temperature or colder. This type of system is usually used to help prevent thermal expansion of the actual machine. Cryogenic liquid nitrogen cooling system. This is quite extreme. Rust resistant. Adding rust inhibitors. The two main categories that they fall into are polar film and passive film. Polar film. Negatively charged long thin molecules that are attracted to metal. Passive film form a seal to block the oxidization process. Stability, long life, storage and use. So basically the product won't break down and separate after a prolonged period of time. Antibacterial, rancidity control. Most cutting fluids contain bactericides that control the growth of bacteria and make the fluid more resistant to rancidity. The bactericide which is added to the fluid by manufacturers must be strong enough to control the growth of bacteria but weak enough not to harm the skin. Non-toxic should be chemically neutral and should not harm the operator of the machine. Transparent so that the operator can see through it into the cutting area. Low viscosity so that it can easily float above the workpiece and will allow chips to settle quickly. Non-flammable and should have a high flash point and should not burn due to heat produced during machining. Types of cutting oils. The two main types of cutting oils is active and inactive cutting oils. Let's start out with active cutting oils. Under active cutting oils there are three main categories. Sulfurized mineral oils, sulfochlorinated mineral oils, and sulfur chlorinated fatty oil blends. I know what you're asking yourself, so what is active cutting oil? Well active cutting oil will actually physically darken a strip of copper when immersed in the solution for three hours at 212 Fahrenheit. Sulfur dyed mineral oil has 0.5 to 0.8 percent sulfur. It is light or transparent in color, has really good anti-weld properties, it is good for cutting low carbon tough metals. It is not recommended for cutting copper and its alloys because sulfur stains copper. Sulfur chlorinated mineral oil contains up to 3% sulfur and 1% chlorine. Prevents built up edge. Good for cutting tough, low carbon and nickel chromium steel. Works well for cutting threads in soft gummy steel. Sulfur chlorinated fatty oil blends contain more sulfur than the other active cutting oils. It's good for heavy duty machining applications. Just like everything else, somebody patented it. This is one of the patents that I came across that was kind of interesting, so I included it. Inactive cutting oil. There are four types. Straight mineral oil, fatty oil, fatty mineral oil blends, sulfur dyes fatty and mineral oil blends. Inactive cutting oil. What is inactive cutting oil? It is defined as will not darken a strip of copper immersed for three hours at 212 Fahrenheit. After that period of time, there is no chemical change to the copper strip. Straight mineral oil. Low viscosity with fast wetting and penetrating factors. It is recommended for machining non-ferrous metals. Works well when machining aluminum, brass, and magnesium. It is also recommended for cutting leaded metals and threading and tapping white metal. Number two, fatty oils. Lard and sperm oil. Limited use in today's world. Generally used for heavy duty applications for cutting. One of the more popular uses for this is lubricating sticks for the bandsaw. 
Another use for this that is not recommended is it's used as a cutting agent for grinding non-ferrous metals like copper, aluminum, brass. Fatty and mineral oil blends. Fatty and mineral oil mixes will result in a better wetting action and penetration. It is often used to improve the surface finish of non-ferrous metals. Number four, sulfurized fatty and mineral oil blends has excellent anti-weld properties. Used with a machining application that has high cutting pressure and vibration. Used to produce high surface finish on non-ferrous metals. It is also used when machining ferrous and non-ferrous metals at the same time. Cool tool is my favorite or was my favorite type of tapping fluid. It's been off the market for a very, very long time. It contains one, one, whatever, I'm not even going to say it. But that stuff is not good for you. It's been proven to be rather toxic, possibly causing cancer. Back in the day, it used to say on the front of the container, contains. Now, some of them will say does not contain. Uh, because these are relatively more safer products than what they were before. Now, Cool Tool is not the same as Cool Tool 2. Cool Tool 2 does not contain band additive. All cutting oils are toxic. Some people are going to disagree with me. That's okay. Leave your comment in the comment section below. Now, the reason why I say this is the fumes that come off of them during machining are toxic. Make sure that you use your cutting oils in a well-ventilated area. Good old-fashioned homemade cutting oils. Yes, you can make your own homemade cutting oils with just stuff you have laying around the house. Here's a couple of the recipes. Keep in mind, I am not endorsing these at all. Some of these blends are toxic and flammable, so use extreme caution. Kerosene and rubbing alcohol work well with aluminum, but keep in mind, both of those products are highly flammable. Home brew for light tapping oil. 70% vegetable oil, 5% detergent, 20% water. This is the James Bond of tapping oil because it's shaken, not stirred. Must be shaken up well because the mixture will separate. This works well with hand tapping and light machining. High pressure cutting oil. This is an active cutting oil. 78 parts grapeseed oil. 20% sulfur. Hexamine. It's a type of solid camp fuel. Uh, it needs to be heated and cooked for a certain period of time as well. This application unless you're doing just experimental, probably is not worth doing. I do apologize for butchering some of the words in here. I tried my best. Hopefully you could understand what I was saying. If you have any comments, uh, please leave them in the comment section below. If you have other recipes that worked for you, uh, please include them in the comments below as well. If you got any value out of this video, please like and subscribe. It's free and it'll help me out. All you have to do is click on the icon on my face and I'll do the rest. Thank you for watching and have a great night.